50 million dollars. That is an unimaginable amount of money, but in the 14 years that Games Done Quick, or GDQ, has been holding speedrunning marathons, that's how much money it's raised for charity. Despite such a monumental total sum, GDQ says its median donation is just $25. It's millions of people, from eager fans to devoted volunteers and tight-knit staff, that make the biannual marathon stream happen. It certainly doesn't happen on its own. Twice a year, GDQ holds an event that runs for seven days, 24 hours per day, which is not only shown live to an audience sometimes in the thousands, but also streamed live on Twitch for millions more. I talked with Jason Deng, director of technology at GDQ, to understand just how much goes into producing each event. As the director of technology at GDQ, he oversees almost every department. Although runners, fans, and volunteers make up the soul of GDQ, Technology is at the core of the operation, and it has been since GDQ's inception. Let me back up for a minute though. Games Done Quick started unofficially in 2010, organized by Mike Uyama. At the time, it wasn't much more than a few friends getting together and streaming them playing classic games really fast. Despite some technical problems and 2010-era streaming sensibilities, it was clear that the format worked. At that first event, GDQ raised over $10,000 for humanitarian organization CARE. And it hasn't stopped since. GDQ now hosts two main events each year, Awesome Games Done Quick, or AGDQ, that raises money for the Prevent Cancer Foundation in the winter, and SGDQ, or Summer Games Done Quick, that raises money for Doctors Without Borders in the summer. Although these main events are the star of the show, GDQ hosts events throughout the year, including Frame Fatales, which is an event focused on all women speedrunners, and Unapologetically Black and Fast, which is an event focused on all black speedrunners. There's also a revolving door of smaller streamed events live on the Games Done Quick Twitch channel each week. If you're looking for recommendations, my favorite is Speedruns from the Crypt. But there's been a clear focus since the first event to make GDQ better, improving the in-person event and the stream to turn it into the behemoth it is today. And behind the scenes, it is quite the operation. Now, Dang oversees a lot of the tech at each GDQ event, but he's directly responsible for the network stack and the servers. GDQ needs to use the hotel's internet, but one word consistently came up during my conversation with him, redundancy. Although problems are few and far between, hopefully, there's a full system in place to keep the stream running if needed. That includes a cellular backup to keep the stream live, as well as a string of uninterruptible power supplies that can keep everything running for, dang reckons, around 30 minutes without electricity. That has been put to the test, too. Still, problems are bound to come up with a stream that's running around the clock for a week. Thankfully, there is a minimum setup that's required to keep the stream live, which will display GDQ's technical difficulty screen that reads, this has never happened before. If everything goes wrong, there is a live view that GDQ can feed directly into the stream. Now, there is an in-person component of GDQ, but keeping the stream live is the first priority. I mean, after all, GDQ is a fundraising event for charity, and the majority of donations come through the stream, those donations being made directly to the charity that GDQ is supporting. The in-person component does complicate the tech a bit more, though. In-person, GDQ is dealing with decades worth of consoles, dozens of runners with their own needs and input methods, live and streamed audio, and tight turnaround times to get one runner off the stage and get the next one set up. In previous years, GDQ only had a single stage. When a runner was finished, the stream would cut to an overlay and 12 to 15 minutes would pass before the next run would start. The tech team also maintains a stock of consoles, particularly retro consoles that have been modded for modern display systems. GDQ takes RGB colors out through SCART, an old analog video connection, runs them through a retro tink converter, and then feeds an HDMI matrix. The matrix is able to output signals to the stream and to the various monitors that GDQ has set up both for runners and for the in-person audience. It's an elaborate setup, but GDQ isn't able to just take a video feed and call it a day. 
It needs computing power to run its complex overlays and encode the stream without any downtime. There are three computers that GDQ is using, all running AMD's Threadripper CPUs. There's a compositing computer that handles the different elements on screen, an encoding computer that keeps the stream looking clean, and a recording computer that keeps archives of the marathon. Today, GDQ has moved toward enterprise-grade hardware to keep everything running smoothly 24 hours a day, but it wasn't always that way. In more recent events, GDQ has actually combined some of its PCs and put them into server racks to reduce the space they take up. Although GDQ has plenty of redundancy, modded consoles, and all the server hardware you could want now, it still has tech challenges to face. The most recent hurdle has been, of all things, gaming monitors. You see, runners have been calling for higher refresh rates. That's not only due to the smoothness, but also because certain tricks in speedruns. In the game Lies of P, for example, there is a trick that allows you to zip across the map, and it works best at 120 frames per second. You need to be able to see all that if you're running the game. Now, GDQ can't just buy a bunch of high refresh rate monitors and throw them at the problem. There's a lot more that goes into it when you're thinking specifically about speedrunning. The Omni Gamer, author of the excellent book Speedrun Science, if you're interested in this, definitely check out that book, actually ran a series of pretty intense tests to determine what the best monitors to use would be and the organization settled on some combination of some older BenQ displays and newer ViewSonic monitors. Deng says that these higher refresh rates have even replaced the need for heavy, super expensive, and super hard to repair CRT televisions for retro games in many cases. Now make no mistake, an event like GDQ truly takes an army. You have different departments of tech from the stream to the stage, stage managers and producers, a list of hosts and interviewers, and all of the volunteers that come together to get the work done. Still, there's a lot of pressure. With a rat's nest of cables, dozens of staff and volunteers, endless racks of equipment, and a stream that holds millions of dollars for charity on its back, there's pressure to keep everything running. Despite that pressure, Deng says that the community surrounding GDQ is what really keeps it going. Now, at the time this video is going live, Summer Games Done Quick has just wrapped up, but you can watch all the archives on the GDQ YouTube channel and catch its weekly streams on Twitch. The next major GDQ event isn't far off though. We don't have exact dates, but it should take place in the winter. But in the meantime, thank you so much for watching. Make sure to leave a like on this video and get subscribed. This isn't our typical content, but this was a ton of fun to do as someone who's been watching GDQ for years. So thank you guys so much. I will see you in the next video.